first met Toby in the Chicago airport. Um, I was heading for LA. He was going to Cannes with Chainsaw. We knew a about each other because we were both from Texas, and we were both a couple of the first people to make movies out of our generation in Texas. Um, and so we sat and talked uh, briefly in Chicago, and I said, I'd love to see the film you're taking to France. And he said, well, let me set you up a screening in L.A. when you get back up there. And I, so he set up a screening. I brought along my friend Paul Schrader, who had not made Taxi Driver or anything. We were blown away by the film because it broke all the rules and it invented a whole new genre of shocking, violent, cathartic horror. Two years later, this is about 1976, um, Toby came to me and asked me to write a script. Uh, because after uh, Khan, he got Billy Friedkin interested in him. And Billy Friedkin decided he would produce a movie that Toby would direct. We didn't make it. And on the right as I was finishing that, uh, my friend Jim McBride came to me and said, let's do Breathless. So that ended up after, after we did Breathless. And then I did Paris, Texas. And my agent said to me after Paris, Texas had won the grand prize at Cannes, um, wow, you put yourself on the map of serious screenwriters. And I went, uh-oh, okay, let me see the map. And then I said, I've got to do something that takes me off this map. And almost synonymous with that, Toby came to me and said, I'd like you to do Chainsaw too." Back off, fucker! But I knew that if we were going to do the second one, it had to be different from the first one, and Toby and I both agreed on that. The key to the first one was that it was outrageous. Therefore, you have to be outrageous in another way in the second one. The, the script that, that Kit originally wrote was much more of a, of a satire, and I think that that's what um, uh, intrigued a lot of the people that signed on to do the film. Uh, not to say that they wouldn't have done it just to work with Toby and just because it was a sequel to a very successful film, uh, but just as a pure horror film, I'm not sure that it would have been as interesting to all of those people as the, the script that they were actually presented with. We are on our way to the biggest party of the world. Yeah. <laughs> In the first one, the victims were hippies. So we have to figure out who would be the next person that these guys would want to kill. And I, and I went to the mall in Dallas and looked around and there were all these people running around in pastel sweatsuits, buying all kinds of stuff. And it was, they were yuppies. It was like, oh yeah, that's who they want to kill. So that gave uh, shape to, okay, then they were to be in a chili contest at a yuppie organization had sponsored. I mean, it was like the pieces of the elements of the story were there. And that's when we tried, okay, so it was, a, it was about the Sawyer family. We gave them a name. Number one, the Sawyers are number one. <laughs> and then we gave Lefty Enright, the Dennis Hopper character, a family. He was the uncle of the kid in the wheelchair who was killed in the first one. Franklin. And then as he got into this, he discovered that Stretch, the lady DJ, is his illegitimate daughter. So I mean, there's two family stories interfaced here. What was interesting is that we, we took, this family is very vulnerable. That's why they sort of fall apart. I mean, what we did was give a Leatherface an inner life, which he didn't have in any of the other movies, really, that he falls in love with this girl. You know? And that it is, I mean, what we were also doing at the time was 
satire of all these, these teenage movies that John Hughes was making, this whole chain of teenage movies, which we were going to, we got to also mess with that, too. Yeah. But this is for Rick the Pimp. He wants to hear bright lights, big titties. Wrong. I don't want to hear it. I want to see it. But the tone of the film was to make it a comedy. I'm the Lord of the Harvest. Who's that? Some new health food bunch? Because you didn't want to make a serious film out of this. If you're going to do it again, you have to blow people's minds in another way. Um, so he also invented the idea that there was a love story between Leatherface and Stretch, you know, um, which wasn't going to work out, as she says. This is just not going to work out. What about me? Listen, this is not going to work out. <laughs> so the characters and the, and, the, and the way they were portrayed, the Chainsaw family, this time around, they were totally eccentric. Peel that pig and slice him thick. <laughs> the heart and soul of each of them was absurd. Well, a big, big pregame brunch tomorrow means a ton of croissant sandwiches. Oh, oh I love this town. Hey, you it took about three weeks to do the first draft of the script. So by the middle of March, or the end of March, we were headed to Texas to secure locations. Then, we started pre-production in April, um, and the weekend before we were to start shooting, Cannon sent down a studio exec who announced to us in a production meeting on Sunday night, we are taking a million dollars out of your budget. What the shit? I started rewriting. I rewrote during the entire shoot of that film. The script was a work in progress. I mean, we were, Kit Carson, the writer, was working on that the whole time we were shooting. As a matter of fact, the uh, prop man, Mike Sullivan, looked over his shoulder at one point and said, Kit, you can quit writing that scene. We just shot it. So, uh. Shooting began, I think, in May, and then we shot, and I have a script that it says June 28th, final, and we finished shooting on the 4th, so that script is pretty much, I mean, I was rewriting the whole time. I mean, you know, when, we, when you rewrite during production, the pages have a different color with each rewrite. And this script was like a rainbow. of Never seen that many colors in the script. And it worked. That script, I think, was pretty awesome. And he was there, you know, and he, he, he acts, and he was, he, was, he was there all the time, and he was very uh, uh, interactive. He was very collaborative, as was Toby. By the end of it, we had three crews shooting simultaneously. And for the last three days of the shoot, we had three crews shooting simultaneously, just to get it all in. Because we didn't compromise with what we wanted in the movie. Small business man that always, always, always gets it in the ass. So we made the cut. And then we had a screening, cast and crew screening. And the audience laughed throughout the film. And the screening was in the screening room at Cannon. And at the end of the screening, Toby comes to me and says, uh-oh. And we go into a meeting with uh, Cannon, and they say, we want to see the monsters. We want to see the monsters. That's what the audience wants. We want to see the monsters. So take out all this stuff. And they were like stunned that the film was funny, which if you'd read the script, you would know that it was funny intentionally. Um, I don't know why they didn't get that, but that was the moment at which things changed. And they, they did whatever they wanted to do we, we preserved as much of the film as we could, but basically this whole subplot of Dennis discovering that Stretch is his illegitimate daughter. Lefty. Sister. Lefty. Which has a, a heart to it, you know, and gives both of them some emotional juice in going through this story. That went away. The whole movie is about family. 
and the craziness of family and families moving apart and coming together. And um, all of that storyline was lost and it was really, it, it was pretty terrific. You know, there were some really terrific moments that I think would have fleshed the whole thing out and made it a lot more entertaining. I don't really have any complaints about the product that Canon created, the contraption of the film that they created, because there was nothing anybody could do about it. You know? We're glad that the film is the film, because you know? people don't get to make movies, you know? Actually, on the last night of the shoot, on January, July 4th, I was outside sitting in my writer's chair with my Olivetti portable in my lap, writing, and they're pulling scenes out of my typewriter. And I passed out there, because we shot all night. And I, was, I, can, I, I woke up, I was passed out on the street in my chair, and they said, the film's finished. It was like, God. So, but there was something thrilling about that challenge, about continually rewriting the film as we shot, um, and going so fast. Yeah. I like all that. Toby sort of deputized me to be the, like, hit the beach and go to Austin. He wanted to use Chorus because he knew Chorus. When he decided to do the first Texas Chainsaw, uh, he came and talked to me about it, but I was already booked on doing another film that's totally forgettable and it just disappeared completely. But I had made an, a commitment to these people that I would shoot their film for him, so I wasn't available when he wanted to shoot the first Texas Chainsaw. But we stayed in touch, and just out of the blue one day, the phone rang, and he said, I'm going to make Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, and I'm coming back to Austin, and I would like for you to shoot it for me, because we didn't get to do the first one together. So I said, cool, I'll do that. And we assembled, really, the first crew on a movie that ever came out of Austin. I mean, there had been maybe one Willie Nelson film, kind of a movie, that was shot before. But, I mean, people have come up to me years later and say, you hired me and got me into the movie business, you know, and this, it's like Carrie White. Carrie White was just a local artist, and we looked at his stuff and went, this guy's perfect. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2 is the second feature that I ever did. I got a call from Curtis and uh, it was, I, you know, knew all these people and, and they were, it was happening very quickly and they needed to, I think the thing that drove the whole process was a release date for, for the show. And boy, it was just an exercise in spontaneous filmmaking. It was just, it, it got put together so fast, it was unbelievable, you know. The design aspects of Chainsaw were so many, I mean, it was a huge film with no budget, you know. So I, I Carrie's fond of telling that story about walking into a a uh, high school or grade school class to talk about making of Chainsaw and they asked him what the scariest part of Chainsaw Massacre was for him and he said the budget meetings. I think that he did an absolutely brilliant job of you know with limited resources and limited time of creating this underground world that most of the film takes place in. Carrie White's set construction set design was perfect. I don't know how it could have been better. Every diorama, every uh, bit of set dressing brought such authenticity to the film, made acting almost incidental. There was no need to think about what you were doing. You could simply respond. Well, the sets were incredible. 
it should have been frozen in time and just to have a big cocoon put over it and become the haunted house of all haunted houses. And people would flock from around the world to go to this. Who knew? And it was a terrifying place because the way it was lit, the ability to use light to me is the, one of the single most important things in filmmaking. Um, there's genuine artistry in that. This film was very lucky in that the people who got involved with it are top in the imagination quality of their work. As I remember, we only had about a month to put the whole thing together and we didn't even have a location when we started working on it and no idea how we were going to put together a crew that was large enough to build or to supply all of the materials and props and set dressing and sets that were necessary. They delayed starting pre-production because they had a script that they had run an original initial budget on and the budget was too high and so they were forcing Kit and Toby to go back and cut some out of the film and cut the budget down. So there was some wasted time there, but I think we probably had, it's hard to remember, maybe five or six weeks. The most challenging thing about it was just to get it, decide what to do and get it done so quickly because there was just, uh, it, we were under such extreme pressure to get it done. So we all kind of hunkered down, down at 501 at Texas Pacific Film Video, or as it was then known, Third Coast Studios, which Rich, Richard Corus had. And we started building a model of the interior space of the Austin American Statesman press room and started putting in, I mean, we were using uh, tubes from paper towels, toilet paper, anything that was tubular to do that basic tube structure and then try to figure out where the other spaces in that building might be, because most of the film is shot right there in that building. It was just a physically such a difficult place to work in. When, they, when we first went to pre-light the space, we sent the, the riggers up to, to rig the cable, the power cable, to, and to hang the lights. And these guys would go up, and it was in the, it was hot, so they weren't they were just wearing shorts and t-shirts and stuff, and uh, they would go up onto the beams and the rafters. Well, remember this place had been a newspaper printing plant for 40 years or so. They would come down from the rafters, and they were literally black. They got so covered in printer's ink, they looked like Nubians when they would come down from and take a break. It was just amazing. Uh, you know, they were just completely covered. It was. <laughs> Quite amazing. When the sun goes down and the moon comes up. The radio station set, what we wanted to create there was a, a, a kind of a place that had a sense of potential menace. The radio station was great. They had begged, borrowed, and mooched from everybody on earth because you could pick up anything and it had the owner on the back barbed wire samples or clocks or, you know, uh, so it looked like a radio station. Lou Perry's character was such a, he was a wild man, and we just kind of said if he works in a place, it's going to be a pretty wild looking place, so, uh, you know, we we kind of fed off that and, and dressed it accordingly. We, we were sort of uh, in sort of a hyper-realistic hyper-naturalistic mode as far as how we were lighting the thing. We wanted everything to be pretty dramatic and to easily uh, let us tweak it into a real sense of menace where there were deep shadows and things that were hidden and things that you couldn't see and at least there was implied menace if not real menace. But at the same time we didn't want that to be telegraphed when you first went into the place so that the lighting changes as the dramatic action changes but it's still recognizably the same place. The script described the truck 
uh, just going to a vacant lot and going into a hole in the ground. And I was thinking, boy, that's that's not very visual. And that's kind of when we came up with the uh, the uh, the old abandoned amusement park idea, which sure was a lot better than kind of a hole in the ground. And then we used the amusement park and then in the old press room there at the Statesman building, we, we created this subterranean cavern that was their lair and that was really a lot of fun. It was, we, we, we had a lot of fun with that one. The American Statesman printing plant when we first walked in there was just this enormous room. I think it was 175 feet long and 120 feet wide and like 90 feet high. It's just a, a giant, giant space. And the, the charge was to turn this into this very elaborate, multi-layered uh, area with all these different little performance areas and nooks and crannies and tunnels and connected together. And it had to look like it was underground, which meant that you had to have earth and this feeling of being underground. Uh, you know, it was a junkyard sort of palace in a way. We had a lot of old, well, we built in a lot of the lighting with uh, old busted lamps and Christmas tree lights and whatever we could find that would plug in and you know light up. But then, um, you know, we we bought these big sauna tubes and created these miles of sort of spaghetti-like uh, uh, pipes, sewer pipes, and we you know, sprayed them and made them look like, hung them from the, from the uh, trusses up there. And, and then we had this stuff they called erosion ma uh, control material and we made sort of vine or root looking stuff hanging down. And just, you know, we built this smokehouse in there with the, the skulls and the, the bones built into it. We had a lot of fun on that one. I think the main, the main challenge was just trying to get enough stuff, enough bones. I mean, Jay Raymond, who was more or less like my assistant on the thing, uh, he went out and found boneyards in central Texas on farms and ranches where they had buried their, or you know, just thrown their dead cattle. And we, so we brought, brought that stuff in. We scoured the countryside, finding, going out to pastures to try to find all the bones we could get. We went to the Salvation Army and bought all this old furniture and we made the most outlandish sort of baroque uh, bone furniture you could ever imagine. And whatever was missing on a table or chair, we substituted bones. And I just, I remember walking into the warehouse there one day and they'd come back with a bunch of bones that were still a bit on the green side and it just, whew, it was like, God, how do you guys stand it in here? And they were like, ah, oh, you get used to it after a while, it's okay. The, the big task, lighting task on this whole film, especially in all the underground stuff, was just concealing the instruments in such a way that, that you know, we could shoot pretty fluidly and pretty flexibly. Another great example of that, and I think, you know, we, we came up with a couple of really innovative solutions on the film. The, the sequence where is the long chase through the tunnels. When Toby first told me about that, I said, man, I said, how are we going to light this? Because we're, we're on a wide angle lens, we're pulling back through a tunnel that's maybe eight or nine feet high, and that's, that's you know, maybe, you know, 15 feet in diameter. Where am I going to put lights? We're not building this from scratch to where I can have the, the set people build you know, areas that I can withdraw the lights into, it's just a, it's just a metal tube. So where am I gonna put lights? So what we decided to do was sort of build into the character of the Chainsaw family that they were pack rats, that they just collected shit. So we did tableaus with uh, skeletons for uh, close to a quarter of a mile of uh, uh, space so that there were there are two skeletons at the beach with beach umbrella. There's a, uh, a, a dog that Carrie remembered from Ellis Mercantile, a prop house in LA. It was a dead uh, uh, German shepherd and we put him on a treadmill. Uh, and then there, of course, there was a, a Franklin who was left over from the first film with the flashlight and he's in his wheelchair. 
and a lot of the stuff they stored there were old lights. And so some of these lights worked. They were old lamps and floor lamps and table lamps and, and strings of construction lamps and stuff that they had salvaged. And so what I had the art department do was just literally go out and get truckloads of old lamps from junkyards and from antique stores and so on. And we just mounded these things up along the edges of the tunnel and we lamped up and rewired and made to work most of those l lights. I mean, we were faced with doing close to a quarter of a mile of uh, chase space. So you have to be able to switch things out. Honestly, there were a lot of wonderful creative people on there and it was such a spontaneous thing. It was just like, okay, this is what we're gonna do and everybody just killed themselves and and made it happen. The thing that was hardest about the film for not only for me, for everybody, was that it was just a death march. I mean, the, the hours that we were working and, you know, the conditions, the heat on the set, and we had some fires on the set, and, uh, you know, the air was bad, and it's 120 degrees plus, and the printing plant and the air conditioning didn't work, and it was on and on. And on. So it was just physically so exhausting. It was really, I've done, done a lot of shows. It's the only one that I've ever done that's like that, that's been just instantaneous filmmaking, you know? You know, I'm one of these people that doesn't need very much sleep, and for the first time in my life, when that film wrapped, for the next three weeks, I took, I had to take a nap every day, just to kind of catch up. I, I walked out of there on the 4th of July, and I had been in that building for like 32 hours straight. I walked out in the sunshine and just blinked, and like, God, maybe there will be life after this. I, it was, it was quite a grueling process. your fearless reporter live from Dallas. It was full of action and boldness and she was taking some action. She was scared as hell. But it was the kind of person, it was the kind of character I knew I wanted to play. It was the kind of woman I knew I wanted to play. LG. What, Norma? Leave on Chainsaw 2 it was simply Toby and Kit calling me up. Hey, we're gonna skin you alive. Wanna be in Chainsaw 2? Something like that. And I said, yeah, man, you know, with what I had going, of course. Little granddad hears about this. This was sort of like Leatherface in, not just in name only, but it sort of seemed like it because he was so different. He was in love. He, he was toward, you know, people rather than away from them. And there was the comic element of this, of this film. Leatherface! Did you get her, Bubba? Did you get that bitch? <laughs> you know, I think I think it's the humor. I think it's Chop Top's, you know, skittery ways and his funny lines. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I've got so many of them. They want to hear "Lick my plate, dog dick." So I'm I'm happy. You know, and it's funny because uh, you know I've said that a lot of times, and um, I still have fun doing it. You know, I never get tired of it. Red River Rock and Roll Request Line, this is Stretch. Good they were doing a casting in Austin, and they were looking at some Texas actresses. And uh, I drove to Austin from Dallas, 
and uh, there was this conga line of actresses going in and out of this room and it was such a dead silent room and I knew the scene required more meat than that and um, I wanted to make a strong impression and so I went to the end of the hallway all the way to the end and it was probably about 10 yards 15 yards went to the end of the hallway and I ran screaming which is what the script said it's what it said I ran screaming down the hallway I busted through the doors I pulled them, Kit and Toby, out of their chairs, grabbed their chairs, and I piled them up in front of the door. And I played the scene. Sometimes I think that's what it takes. You've got to show that you're, you're going to do the job. I love working with Caroline. I mean, she's a, you know, she was a local girl, you know, local meaning, you know, a, a Texan. Um, you know, fortunately, you know, we both had relationships. She didn't have to, you know, kick me away with her Texas boots. and. Uh, but I just, I just loved working with her. I mean, it was really a lot of fun. Hey, what's in here? Record vault. Oh, where you keep the golden oldies? What I do remember the most was that she was an incredible trooper because she had to go through some horrendous things uh, in the making of the film, and she never complained. I mean, she was just, she was willing to do it and do it again and do it again. The first scene I shot was the chili cook-off, and it was the first time I ever met Lou. And we walked through and blocked the scene, but Lou hadn't shown up on the set yet. So as we rehearsed, that was the first time I'd ever met Lou. And nearly from the moment I made my entrance into the chili cook-off room and entered into the scene with him during rehearsal, we clicked. We just clicked. I'm not sure if I knew what to make of this high-energy girl. Um, with the, her distinctive looks, and uh, we're going for this energetic girl, and so it was very giving. The stuff in the radio station, I think that's probably where we started, and it went well, and it was fine. And I think that relationship was, was Stretch's grounding, her entire grounding for the whole film, and it just worked on so many levels. Another cussing caller. You little ass gonna be in big trouble over that tape, girl. Nope. I didn't want the camera to be down at the end of the ice bucket, and I walk on the set, and there it is. And when the wardrobe person had brought me a pair of panties to wear, wear these just in case they see your underwear. Of course, in today's vernacular, that's nothing. That's innocent. I may as well have been Doris Day wearing all those cute little, you know, 1950s outfits. Um, you know, it unrolled exactly as it was written on the page. Uh, I knew what I was in for. I didn't think it'd be that cold, <laughs> that wet. <laughs> the the, uh, the ice tub scene is a little, you know, hmm, delicate. This is a delicate scene. Trying to make it sexy Oh man, it was it was uh, it was a dance. It was a dance. She was incredibly positive, which is great because that was just such a you know a terrible position to be in, to be stalked and you know, and brutalized the way she was. We actually at one point joked about creating a scream academy for horror film actresses because we actually came up with gradations of screams, screams with a certain guttural quality, <laughs> screams that are a little more animalistic, <laughs> screams that are more operatic. <laughs> there was a whole language of screaming that came out in that film. <laughs> I have to tell you, the whole time that my head was in that bucket, I was laughing my ass off. I tried to just morph it into a sort of a combination crying, throwing up, and I hope that it read that way. Because, uh, I mean, poor old grandpa and the rubber mallet. And it was crazy. It was a crazy, wild, funny scene. But it was lighthearted. There was a lighthearted, I don't know if it came across that way, but it was a very lighthearted uh, break from most of, of the stuff that we were doing.
That was gross. It was just gross, and I felt sick, and I hated look. The, uh, there was the smoke. LG's makeup as he's dying, and I have a, I had a real emotional attachment to, to Lou at that point. We had become good friends. We had really bonded as friends. She was obviously someone that I could uh, uh, relate to enough to care about that I could say I'm falling apart on your darling or, you know, that. But I did not know what she was going to bring. I had no idea that she was going to bring so much of um, the recognition of, oh, my God, I am really clear, uh, fond of this person. I do love this guy. Oh, my God. What have I done? <laughs> I don't think he's dead yet, really. I don't think he really died. I think he got married to Stretch and they moved away. That's what I think. Anyway. You know, Lou was in Texas. If, 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 you know, there was a Texan, big, tall Texas guy with a Texas accent, uninhibited, completely uninhibited, it was Lou Perryman. He, he had such a, a great feeling for life that, um, again, he was willing to persevere, not only persevere through everything, but actually have a good time doing it. Of course, he has a long relationship with Toby, too, so they, you know, that was, their friendship was, uh, you know, was very evident through the film. Oh, what an opportunity for LG. Oh, man, you know, I just played with him. Um, the first scene there where I had to, uh, I think we're going home from the from the radio station, I just all of a sudden had this image that LG thinks he's kind of like Paul Newman in Hood. You know, that he's really cool looking, you know, and that he can lean up against the door and profile and it'll just knock her out. You know, that she'll just swoon. So I was operating on that. And then, you know, the next thing I know, Toby walks up to me and says, what do you feel like doing here? I said, you know, Toby, I feel like spitting. <laughs> you know, I mean, I had a guy come to me at a convention. He said, did you make your own loogies or did they give you something to help you make the loogies? Like, goddamn, man, people love loogies. Everybody got loogies, and, but nobody uses loogies. You know, shit. I don't know where that came from. The Fry House, man, you know, that has legs that are beyond me. Because it's just like, and that line, built your little Fry House. Oh, man. People swoon over that. People just make out. I met my number one fan in the world. And I just had the hunch. I was at a convention, and I... She came up and she told me that she watches it every Halloween. And I put my arm around her, somebody's gonna take a picture, and I said, built your little fry house, darling. And she just went, oh. <laughs> What the hell's going on here? I first saw um, the original uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre like a week before I auditioned. I got the audition call and it was, you know, told it was based on this movie and I hadn't seen it yet, so I went and rented it. And there's no way to, to try to outdo this guy, Gunnar Hans. <laughs> no, he nailed that space done and, and closed it up forever behind him, so. But, you know, that's, I think when you do something great, that's, the natural way that it is, but he was inspiring. It was it was an odd thing to have known Gunner as a, such an intelligent and and uh, a bright guy, and to you know, to, and and here's another guy behind a damn awful mask, this bright and beautiful and sweet. Bill is a very soulful man. He, he's a man with very deep feelings. He's got a very deep uh, emotional nature. 
which worked perfectly for the relationship between Stretch and Leatherface. Um, their love story of sorts is contingent on that quality, and he has that. Bubba likes her. Bubba's got a girlfriend. 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 Bill Mosley. What a enigmatic, ineffable, wonderful person. We <laughs> is always fun to to be with. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of, you know, stimulating conversations. We spent time in the air conditioned trailers because it was like so hot. Bill was the morale. Bill was the, the morale of the shoot. His personality, his chop top, his ad libs, you know, everything about Bill. And Bill's, there's a bust of Bill in my yard. It's been sitting here for 20 years. It's the actual bust we made of him to create the makeup. And it's aging over there. Bill doesn't age, the bust ages. Well, I had seen the original in, back in 74 or 5. I saw it in Boston in the combat zone in, on an afternoon matinee, the this, this second end of a double bill with uh, Enter the Dragon. <laughs> After seeing Chainsaw, it really, you know, bummed me out. I, I became afraid of rural America. And, uh, you know, like what is in those sausages, you know, glistening in that little rotisserie at the gas station. And, um, and it, it, it did, it, it bummed me out. Bill Mosley, Toby said there was this guy who was like, he went to school at Yale, and he was an actor, and he's got, he made a short called Texas Chainsaw Manicure. We went out to Staten Island and took over Sonia's Hair Fashions one afternoon, one Sunday afternoon, and shot the Texas Chainsaw Manicure. Oh, it's heavy! And I was out visiting a, a buddy of mine uh, from school who lived out in Sherman Oaks and who was a screenwriter who was a, turned out to be, a, an, ended up being a very famous and uh, wealthy screenwriter. Anyway, uh, my, his, my, my friend Pete, and uh, I brought the, a copy of the manicure out just to amuse people because it was kind of like nothing else to do with it. And uh, he took a look at the manicure and he thought it was hilarious. And he said, you know what, why don't you leave this copy with me because I have an office right down the hall from Toby Hooper. Well, at least you didn't mess me up. <laughs> and I had done a little cameo as the hitchhiker in the, at the end of the Chainsaw Manicure, where, you know, it's my wife that has gotten this wonderful manicure and I go, hey, that's great, honey. We, we should celebrate with some head cheese. And I actually went out and bought a lump of head cheese, which I don't advise, and I actually licked it in one take, which really was a bad idea. But anyway, Toby, you know, liked that characterization. And he said, I said, well, geez, that was me, Toby. And he said, well, if I ever do a sequel, I'll keep you in mind. Two years later, I got a call saying, you know, where do we send the script? Ah! Is there a, is there a, a wire coat here? <laughs> Well, then they wanted me to shave my head because of all the chop top makeup really was gonna, wasn't going to really work with a bald head cap. Um, and so they wanted me to shave my head. And so I would, you know, I would have shaved my ass and walked backwards for that part. Bill was one of our, Bill was our buddy. You know, we, Bill, we convinced Bill to shave his head to take an hour off the makeup process. We couldn't very well put a bald wig on him. And uh, so we convinced him, you know, to uh, shave off his head. And we actually socialized with Bill. We were happy hour together. Because he spent a lot of time with us. You know, that makeup took four hours at first. I think we got it down to three. So whenever Bill was on camera, which was a lot, he came to us first. So it was a lot of time in our studio. I was always sort of on edge with him. And uh, I was always a little bit afraid of him. Even though I liked him very much, and, and he was certainly a very civil, basically a very civilized guy. It was, there was still that unpredictable, edgy thing that endures to this day. Mosley? Mosley was crazy. But, but, he, but he wasn't crazy. He was a good guy kicked back. But he got into his role real easy and real quick. I was, you know, as Kit Carson said, uh, you know, Bill as we knew him was gone for those eight weeks. And I became Chop Top. No, please! Shut up! <laughs> Go 
told you to go check it out, boy, before I start kicking your ass. Some kind of crazy booger just skits through here. Jim Cito, you know, is a really is a dirty old man. I mean, he's a great guy, lovely wife Ruth, and you know, he's a funny guy, but uh, was a funny guy, but uh, really had the you know the greatest dirty jokes I've ever heard. Jim, God bless him. I grew up with a generation of men like Jim, you know, good old Texas boys, you know, sweet, kind, loving, fun-loving, very strong, very enduring. Uh, his relationship with his wife was just delicious. C. Dow. C. Dow was a good guy, just a steady Eddie journeyman. You know, just there to do his thing and, uh, and, and like, you know, he wasn't there when he wasn't there. You know, he just, uh, you know, when he wasn't on camera, you wasn't hearing him yakety yakking or anything like that. He wouldn't sit down. But Jim was, uh, was a very warm, interesting, gregarious, uh, supportive uh, actor who was uh, very comfortable and relaxed and had a great sense of humor. I mean, when I first got to the uh, Brook Hollow Motor Lodge, wherever they put us up, outside of Austin, um, I was wandering around, I was nervous, and you know, kind of, oh, geez, what is this? My first big movie, you know, my second movie, I think, of my life, and you know, like, wow, you know, geez, am I worthy? And you know, all those, you know, all that, all those concerns, and uh, and I'm walking in the parking lot of the motel, and all of a sudden I look up, and there's Jim Cedar, you know, who's just showed up, and there he is. And it was just like, whoa, you know, it's like the cook, you know. Just seeing him, you know, in civilian, you know, it was just Jim, you know, he never had any makeup. But it was just so amazing to me. I mean, it just it was like, wow, that, that more than anything else, just kind of, you know, welcomed me into this mad world that was just so much fun. Boys, boys, boys. What the hell's going on here? I got to know Dennis uh, on the press junket that came into existence in a bolt of lightning after Easy Rider, and everybody wanted to talk to him. And I did this interview with him, which which he considered like the best interview he'd ever done. Uh, and he we just went as close to the edge as he could go, and then like fell off and came back. You know? So I knew that he was the right soul for this. And he didn't, he in no way acted like it was beneath him or that he shouldn't have been there. He was, he was a complete professional and really, you know, dedicated to, to not only trying to make the character be what Toby wanted it to be, uh, but, you know, real, real participant. He had technique, which I had not yet really acquired as an actor. He had an ability to shape and mold every moment to maximize that screen time for the audience. He was so geared to what he thought the audience would want to see. That was an ongoing education for me. Dennis Hopper would, um, when Toby would say action, Dennis Hopper would spin, just stand up and spin as fast as he could and make himself dizzy. So then when he stopped, he had this look in his eye, you know, that I guess he wanted. He's a method actor, you know, so that, I learned a lot from that. I mean, watching his technique, you know. And uh, his 50th birthday was on the set. And we brought in a big cake, and Dennis disappeared. And he came back and went, Rawr! and he, he had a chainsaw, and he cut the cake with the chainsaw, in the spirit of things. It was just, it was a world in and of itself. And learning about screenwriting, learning about uh, set design and set decoration, learning about makeup, special effects makeup, learning about stunts. I 
I just feel so glad to be have been part of a, a cast that was so ensemble oriented. Everybody pitched in, okay, yeah, I need to shove that saw in my nose harder. Yeah, go, go for that. That's good, yeah. Twist it, that's it, good. Now we're doing it. I'm amazed at the people that write me and email me that they love Chainsaw 2, that there was some character thing in it. Like the Fry House, man. This unrequited love of this guy that calls this girl darling, and she says, don't call me darling. He says, what's wrong, darling? You know, he just doesn't get it that she doesn't want his affection. And there's something beautiful and pure about that. And that was written for me all I, you know, I brought what I brought. But that wasn't in Chainsaw One. You know, what the, the thing that kind of united the cast was that we all knew the, you know, how momentous this job was. This wasn't just any job. This wasn't just any movie or slasher movie for that matter. This was the sequel to the greatest horror movie ever made. The Saw is family. <laughs> Okay, well, let's see. I brought some uh, little show and tell thing here. This is the original uh, Chainsaw 2 coat hanger, or one of them. And this is actually the Chainsaw 2 lighter. And I think it might still have a little bit of gas in there. Whoa. <laughs> yep. Ah, uh, ooh, yeah. Mmm, napalm crinklies. This is actually the, uh, you know, the original chop top costume. Um, some of these buttons, of course, you could never see them on screen, but uh, here's a nice one that says, uh, hippie with a haircut, uh, Texan till I die, and my favorite, uh, don't be scared, I just ate. There they are, the original chop top teeth. I am actually gonna put these in my mouth. And you can see this transformation from this handsome, middle-aged gentleman uh, to, uh, you know, a psychopath. Ready? Here we go. <laughs> Dog will hunt. Get that dish, Leatherface, get that ditch. <laughs> Dog will hunt. Ugh. Well, Tom is, I mean, a complete professional, so, I mean, it, you know, there were never any, not only not any surprises, but he thinks about what the camera sees extremely well. He's a hell of a lot of fun to hang around with. Tom is a gas. He's just fun. He's sexy, he's funny, he's bright, he's smart, he's creative. What's not to like? <laughs> mm. All right, boy, after a hard day of this one, I got a call from Henry Klein. Of course, they, you know, give me the script, let me break it down, let me see how much it's going to cost, blah, 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 blah. And I think I did the old technique of, you know, padding what I wanted, because Henry was a master at working me well. So with him constantly coming at me, talking about, you know, getting the price down, so I eventually got the price down to where I wanted it in the first place, and then we, I sent a truck with equipment to... Um, Texas. The crew just, they, they took care of getting the crew there and housing them and, you know, I showed up with my wife and my daughter who was like nine months old and we started building the stuff. Well, that was a tough one when uh, uh, getting the yuppies had to come up and Sean McEnroe and I used to sit in the parking lot at night long after the day was done and dinner was gone and just trying to think how to do that how to make the top of the because i wanted to use the real actor 
fake head, you know, you look at a fake head longer than three seconds, you know it's fake. So how do we get the real actor's head to split open, you know? So we came up with the idea between the two of us of uh, <clears throat> making a fiberglass dome that fit on the real actor's head and putting a rubber in there or a balloon and just blowing it. And when it inflates, it would, of course, lift the high, the fiberglass dome. Okay, now that was the premise. Now we know we can make the severed appliance with hair on it come apart and pump blood out of it maybe initially on the real actor. We eventually cut to the fake head from behind and I still to this day hate the editing of that. Because <clears throat> the blood just kind of shoots out, you know, and it's like, or you don't see the brains ooze out. It just didn't look in the movie as good as it looked when we did it with the head opening and the brains oozing out and the blood shooting out. We even took styrofoam peanuts, the packing ones, and dyed them red and put those in there so you'd have some brain looking stuff flying out, you know? But it's not in the movie, it didn't, it didn't happen. Are you mad at me? Leatherface, I, I wanted that mask to look like it was a combination of at least two people two or three, and that's what it is. There's a face here, there's another face here. This one has a beard, this might this might be from somebody else, you know? So they were colored differently and they were, you know, ethnically different faces. And Mitch Devane sculpted Leatherface based on that premise. I wanted it to be different people, you know? So, and he did a great job. Let's see your lips there for a second. As a matter of fact, wait. That's a happy guy. Bill Johnson was, to me, um, I connected with Bill because he is really an actor, you know. And, you know, and that's really, you know, I came from acting, directing. I did seven years of repertory theater. I appreciate actors, know what they go through. So uh, I, I connected with him. And there's some stuff on camera of getting him to be Leatherface and improvising. You know, I tried to get them all to do that. I mean, that's a real schizophrenic, you know, freaky-looking mask. Tom Savini... He was, you know, he was very studied and talking, you know, quietly, and, mm -hmm, making sure things were running smoothly. But his his crew, they were awesome. I think I'd like to give you a tattoo. <laughs> We did a thing, because I had come out of Carnegie Mellon University as an acting directing major, and I had been on the Letterman show a few times, you know, so we actually, I actually would talk to Bill on camera, I'm shooting Bill in makeup, and getting him to get into character, you know, asking him questions, it was like, a, it started off as a joke, but it was actually an, an acting exercise, it turned into an acting exercise for Bill, because I would ask him questions and require him to answer me as Chop Top. Tom was always uh, funny. He would always walk around the, you know, he would come into the, what I called the House of Pain, the makeup shop. He'd be wearing, he'd find some kind of plasterers, stilts, you know, and kind of strap them on and walk around. He had a nine month old daughter. Maybe she was like, I don't know, maybe she was two. I don't know, she was just a baby. And I have pictures of her sleeping on these rubber, you know, zombies that he had strewn all over the place. And, you know, the place was just a total madhouse. And, you know, music and, you know, all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, I just had a ball. I mean, it was just so much fun. So, you know, we cast Bill's bald head and a, a jeweler actually did a lost wax casting. This is the, the plate that Bill wore for the movie. There were two of them. I gave one to Sean McEnroe, who actually sculpted the appliance around, you know, Bill's head. But shaving his head did take at least an hour, an hour and a half off that makeup. And it was easier for Bill, too, you know. Hey, hey Grandpa, Bubba's got something to show you here. Look, a slurpy <laughs> booty. <laughs> yeah, Grandpa's makeup, that was nine and a half hours. The first time we did it, you'll see it's all white foam latex. John Vulich, who, who owns Optic Nerve now, sculpted the entire using Dick Smith's technique of breakdown appliance makeup on Dustin Hoffman for Little Big Man. But John did his own sculpture, of course, and rendition of that. But it's basically the same technique. And um, they actually let us hire the actor for 
uh, grandpa. I wanted somebody who was really skinny, because it makes more sense, you know, to have somebody that old to be frail and skinny. So they sent us a whole lineup of actors, you know, and we picked Ken Everett. I liked him because his eyes were so recessed back. And I saw, I could see what the makeup would look like on somebody with eyes that far back and skinny. And Ken, Ken is a Vietnam vet. He was like a tunnel rat in Vietnam. A lot of respect for him. And he was a good actor too. And, and plus, we did the same thing with him. We put the makeup on and have him, you know, do some shtick as grandpa. He was great. We asked, we begged Toby, you got to get a close-up of those eyes, because he wore lenses as well. And the combination of his makeup with those lenses was pretty cool. So we were constantly, can we do the shot now? Toby we got tired of us asking him for a close-up of Grandpa, and he didn't. No, it stands up. It stands up. It's an excellent makeup. I mean, I had the best crew. Gino Crognali and Gay Bartolos and Bart Mixon and um, uh, Mitch Devane. I said John Vulich, didn't I? Yeah. Um, no, these guys were great. We sculpted, we had to cast Lou's entire body. Um, and Gino Crognelli sculpted all the appliances going right from anatomy books. It had to be, I wanted it accurately, anatomically correct. And he sculpted it in the dark. It's like, you know, we had a studio with major lights on tables for where we're working, and he was off in the corner without those lights. I said, Gino, can you see every day? Gino, can you see? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, fine, fine. And the sculpture is incredible, you know? And it was sculpted, as far as I remember, in the dark, you know? So it was, you know, the leg pieces and then the whole chest and then the head was a breakdown makeup with separate appliances that went off. And Toby just loved that. I mean, it was just... And we didn't put a lot of blood on it because we didn't want to cover the anatomical correctness of the pieces. And they were, they were right on. I still have those pieces, you know? The makeup we planned for, I think, to be ready at 8 a.m. So I went in something, like, or 8 or 10 a.m. So I went in something like midnight or 2 a.m. And uh, they had built a slant board. They're planning ahead, figuring I'd go to sleep, which I did. I was tired and, uh, you know, it was time to go to sleep. So I went to sleep and I woke up looking like a freak. Literally, I slept virtually through it. So, you know, I probably put on, I got down to my underwear and then they I just built those appliances all down me because they had made a cast of the leg, the right leg, the right side of the chest, and the head. And um, I just woke up looking like that. It was, uh, yeah, it was absolutely amazing. Did we already talk about Lou's face? Lou's skin face? <laughs> This is the actual piece. This is 20 years old. You know, it's funny because, you know, we designed the makeup apart from them. We need a quick mask to throw on Lou, you know, for the skin. We need a quick piece, you know, and we put it on Lou and it fit. The skin matched up and fit the actual makeup of skin. Yeah, it was pretty creepy. And Caroline wore this as well, you know. That's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, um, Andy Serkin was the mechanical effects guy. He actually built the Steve, Arten, Steve Martin arrow through the head chainsaw. So it actually worked here and worked here. So it was a, it was a wraparound, you know, of the, of the, the stunt guy. So you press the button and it came on here and here. And um, um, one day, and you, you have photographs of this, I said to Sean McEnroe, we're going to need a stomach appliance for... Leatherface to look like the chainsaw has cut him through. So I said this to Sean. I went to the bathroom. I came back. It was done. In like, I don't know, five to eight to ten minutes, he had sculpted in water based clay the appliance. You know, then of course we molded it, you know, just like that. That's how great the crew was. So that was a rubber piece that glued to, uh, you know, Bill, after the end, we had put chunks of flesh, which is just latex matter coming out of it, and the chainsaw in place that wrapped around, and the appliance covered it. And when the chainsaw went, you know, the blood came out, and the guts, the stomach was split open, and, you know, it's a living. <laughs> you know?
the atmosphere was great. I mean, watching Toby work, this was something you don't see every day. You know, a guy with a chainsaw and a guy with a plate in his head, your grandpa makeup. All of it was very thrilling, you know? It was like where I wanted to be at that moment in my life, you know, so. And it was great when the movie was over because we all, you'll see on the tape, we all just stood by the pool and just fell in the pool at the hotel, screaming madly that it was over, the hard work was over, and we could now go home. You know? We went to Disney World. I don't know what the rest of the guys did. Now, to me, Chainsaw is basically Toby Hooper. It was so much fun, and I think, you know, that I that, that Toby was great because he saw that I was chop top, and um, and so he there was a total uh, bond or trust or something going on there because he just let me rip. Slides up. So let me see some pain. And action! It was easy um, because you always knew where you stood with him. I mean, he never really had to ask me how I felt about any given moment because I think he knew I was game from the get-go. And I think he basically knew you give her a little room, let her work with it a little bit, you know, it'll happen. You know, Toby's a great shooter himself, too. He's a very talented uh, cinematographer in his own right. And uh, so it was, a, it was a real pleasure to work on the film with him because I could comp something and light it and set it up and then you know just let him look through the camera or ride the camera on a rehearsal and you know we had a real good cinematographer to cinematographer dialogue in addition to the director cinematographer relationship Order. and cut that's one of the best i've ever seen i think we had our our sweetest time in a way when i got skinned and then I think for the first time, you know, we had the opportunity to really just be there together and everybody was gonna hold until we got ready with what we're gonna do. Of course, we had already had the debate about really, and when a family skins you, do they really leave some longhorn boxer shorts on? Or do they skin them off? And I told Toby, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it naked. I'll do it naked if you want to. I can see Toby going, I don't know how. Yeah, I might get a camera up in here and uh, do that. On the set, he was um, demanding, but not rude, you know, uh, kind, polite, but getting what he wants, you know, over and over again. I mean, we shot takes over and over again. And he had this great voice, but don't forget, he was smoking Monte Cristos. So he's my hero, okay? So, you know, so, but and <clears throat> I loved his voice. I loved his look. He had a beard, you know, hair. Kind of like the way I look right now, a, a mo haircut and a beard, you know. And Toby was just covered with hair and those big glasses and that stogie. And he was, yeah, he had that sort of, you know, <laughs> it was kind of that Beatles haircut, which has not changed as far as I know over the years. And, um, I mean, he's meticulous, Toby. Um, his imagination is being manifested really strongly all the time. And he trusts people. So it's not like he's a control freak either. He's got a very nice, easy presence on the set. But you know that he's going after something. I just remember him being an enthusiastic yes-sayer, being willing to hear from the actor, you know. What do you feel like doing here? Ah, I feel like this right here. Ah, yeah, that's good. I like that. Hang that piece of skin up there. Okay. God damn, is that my old place over there? God. Yeah, man. Oh, you know, Toby's such a character, man. <clears throat> I can see him right now. He walking around there, chomping on that cigar, and, you know, always had a Dr. Pepper in his hand. You know, that was somebody's full-time job, keeping him with, with Dr. Peppers. Uh, oh, I used to get in his MGB, and there'd be so many Dr. Pepper bottles in, in the floorboards on, the, on my side that I couldn't get in. Just about couldn't get in, because he'd go to take them and trade them. He always had a Monte Cristo and a Dr. Pepper. 
And I, so I bought him a hat that would hold two Dr. Peppers with a tube that came down for him to sip off it so he could smoke and drink at the same time without holding the cans. Toby would come in, he'd come in, he'd come up with his briefcase, he'd sit down in his chair, he'd open up, okay, let's get uh, number one. He literally went through that entire film with never not having a Dr. Pepper in his hand. Then all of a sudden from off over here, you know, you see a hand come in, slam down the opened uh, <laughs> Dr. Pepper in the, in the cup holder on his director's chair, click. <laughs> you know, you get that cigar going, and you go, okay, let's take a look at a rehearsal. All right. We're going to pull that off. Okay, good. Here we go. <laughs> Roll it. I knew Toby wanted to do, and so did Carrie, that he wanted to do a different film than the original Chainsaw. He did not want to do the same movie. And so he was always open to whatever it is we were going to try to do. You know, and, and he just let us go. So he sort of brought electricity, a lot of electricity in with him. And then the, the energy level and the intensity and the vibrational rate would increase exponentially until we got up to speed where he was satisfied. And then we would see, you know, start rolling on this and then boom. So that was, that was always kind of far out. Time for incoming mail! scene where I'm, you know, beating LJ with a hammer in the radio station, you know, we did, you know, 12 takes of that. You know, there were a couple, of, you know, there's a lot of takes. I mean, we were doing, like, going into take 13, and I'm thinking, you know, he's going, well, yeah, let's, yeah, that was great, let's just do it again. And I'm just thinking, you know, I, I said, am I doing something wrong here? Because I, you know, I, I, you know, I didn't know, I thought I was screwing it up, and he, that's when he looked at me and said, hell no, Bill, just having fun watching. And when I heard that, I just thought, I am, I, am a, I am such a lucky guy. This is, I can't imagine ever doing anything as, as fun as this. And in this moment, I am so happy. <laughs> Toby turned me into an actor, a working actor. He gave me a whole new mindset about what being an actress in a film was about. And I think I've kept that all this time. And I want to say thank you to him for it. Yeah. Post-production of the film actually started before we wrapped shooting. As I recall, probably three or four weeks before we wrapped shooting. And, you know, what I mean by that is there, we set up an editing room on the set in the American Statesman printing plant, and the editor came from Los Angeles and uh, started cutting the film, and Toby would go and sit with him in between while we were shooting takes. I mean, we made a deal. We made a deal at the end of January, early February, to make a movie as fast as we could and get it into the theaters. They had a release date in, at the end of August. And so Toby was cut way, way short on the amount of time that he had to cut the film. And in order to get any time at all, to literally just even assemble it and spend any time with it at all, he had, we had to start the rough assembly. And that was, that's really rare. And there was something thrilling about knowing you had to go that fast and, and be unstoppable. You know. I, I had great hopes for it. I mean, I, I didn't, you know, I, and I had no, I was naive in the sense that I didn't know how the ratings board was going to view it. And of course, they, they ended up, um, I think the ratings board ended up giving it an X or I think uh, what happened was Canon Films just decided, probably more because of a deadline than anything else, just to release it unrated. Uh, when it was originally released and people questioned uh, why it wasn't really Chainsaw, why it was a, another version of Chainsaw, um, it was sort of like we didn't care. I feel like it's flawed in a lot of ways and but at the same time, 
I think there is a lot of really genius stuff. I think I think it has its moments of really is really great. I thought it was a comedy much more than Chainsaw One had been, because the original scared the p wadden shit out of me. Uh, it scared us on the set, and it scared us to watch it in a theater. I watched people freak out. I think the comparison to the original Chainsaw was unfortunate at the outset when they first released it, uh, because it really it had so little to do except the connection with the Chainsaw family. Artistically, it was nothing at all like the first one. At the time it came out, of course, if you're a fan expecting, oh, Texas Chainsaw Part Two, if you're expecting the same sort of mood and feeling of the first movie, which is really grisly and horror and scary, you know, this one was funny. Chainsaw 2 is there's a lot of humor in there. Then as Harper with chainsaws as you know in holsters, like six shooters with a cowboy hat that's too big for him, you know, it's almost like a, a scary movie parody, you know, almost. I think it's wonderful that that people are recognizing the film for what it is. I think it is better than a lot of the the subsequent sequels. I I, I liked it a lot. It was funny because I saw it in Times Square, <laughs> and. Um, and I was with a friend of mine, um, and after the movie, you know, the credits were rolling and whatever, and we stood up, um, uh, I remember my friend said, hey, everybody, here's Chop Top. You know, I was like, hey, no, man. And, you know, people looked around, they, you know, they looked at me and they didn't see Chop Top. They saw, you know, just another guy. But um, there was one guy, I remember, uh, kind of a long-haired guy, black leather jacket, you know, and he turned around and he, he kind of studied me. And, he, and then he just, you know, he, he held out his hand and said, really liked your work, man. And, uh, and I looked down, I was going to shake his hand, and it was, in fact, a, uh, a cold metal hook. <laughs> I went, okay. Yeah, so I knew that things were good. <laughs> That's the core audience right there. What I loved about the fans, they know the dialogue in the movie. They go to midnight screenings of the movie that now have taken on that Rocky Horror personality in some theaters. Um, it's developed a cult status that I think it really richly deserves. And I think it's a, it's a matter of that it's, you know, something works. If something doesn't work, it's just people aren't going to like it no matter how long it's around. Uh, the fans have been great. They have been just absolutely amazing. They were right about something that we did. And you don't know you don't always know when you're doing something how much legs it's got, how much distance it's going to travel. A lot of people put so much effort into it and a lot of wonderfully creative people put a lot of effort into it. So, you know, that it makes, makes my heart glad that uh, it does get some appreciation, you know? I mean, it was a, it was a film that put us you have to understand at the time the world was very small still so the, the the noise of disappointment had no real effect on us because we knew what we had done and then when we got people coming out of nowhere saying we love it then that was great and, and today it is the cult classic chainsaw movie i mean everyone talks about that chainsaw one of course is a classic but the cult favorite is Chainsaw 2, you know, according to what I gather from conventions and fan mail, you know, so. You know, it was one of those experiences where, you know, we're still pals, so, you know, Bill and Caroline and Lou and Tom Savini, you know, we're all really, you know, we, we bonded on that because, not because it was, you know, because of adversity, but just because it was, you know, really what we loved to do. It was crazy, but it was crazy fun. And I'm really glad that I did it. And I'm glad that people like it. I'm really glad that people like it. It's uh, it's it's fun to uh, to talk with people about it, and I hope people continue to enjoy it. It got me to where I am today. You know, it brought me a professional life that I wouldn't have had. It brought me to California, where I met my husband, and I had my kids, and I had my family. And 20 years later. It's sort of coming back to kiss me on the cheek a little bit. I'm real happy about that. Thanks for asking me all these questions. And <laughs> thanks for supporting Chainsaw 2. <laughs> Give me up! <laughs>
song. 